start my recording back up. There we go. So there you go. That was that was the new format of the study group, or at least the latest format. It's the one I did this month of the study group. I would love to get some feedback. Was it worthwhile? You know, we didn't take any didn't take any live calls. You know, I didn't turn on the phones. They're, they're, they are turned on, but I didn't turn them on. I didn't take any calls from that. So uh, it's one of the things that's a little bit different with this one is that I don't have those calls there for people to be able to take. Uh, but it's a, it's a little bit something, something different to do. There's one thing I can trust the, the user community to do, and that's tell me if it was any good or not. You certainly have no problem telling me that. Never been an issue, especially if it's bad. You guys are really good at telling me, boy, that was just a stinker. And I can appreciate that. I've got a pretty thick skin at this point. I've been on the internet long enough. It, it's, like, uh, it's like bark. It's hard to get in there. Uh, it's not an issue. <clears throat> well, it's the after show. And you know on the after show, we just generally take questions of any kind. If you're in the chat room, you can ask any kind of question. And uh, we've got people on the line. Uh, the 615 area code, you've only been holding for 46 minutes. Are you their caller? It's just white noise. Are you their caller? For those of you that haven't watched the, the study group before, you'll notice that uh, that I don't have, I'm putting you back on hold, caller, uh, I don't have a big crew of people. It's me and about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight screens that are in front of me. Literally eight screens. How did this happen? There are eight screens. So I don't have a call screener. I don't know if people are there. I put that caller back on hold. But the 661 area code's only been holding for a couple of minutes. Are you there, caller? Yes, I am. Yes, How you, you doing are. This morning? Is that Anthony? Yes, it is. How are you, sir? I'm fine. How are you doing this morning? Doing fine. Thanks for calling. So do you, did you watch the whole study group? You know I did. Oh, I appreciate that. And then, So it was a kind of a new format. Well, I think you probably were watching the Network Plus one from last time, though. But what do, you, what do you think of the new format where we just shotgun questions? I think that's great. Okay. I think that's, that's a better format because then it makes you think, and then afterwards we can talk about what you, know, what you went through. Yeah, I, I kind of like taking the calls, and, but it was turning into questions that were getting away from learning the material for the test. And I really want to get the material for the test. So what's up with you these days? Okay, I've been working on my hard drive trying to get that information off. That's been interesting. This has been the uh, migration between operating systems. You had a separate hard drive. You were moving things between one and the other, as I recall. Yeah, the hard drive blue screened on me, and um, I've been trying to. Uh, I bought a third party uh, CD trying to reboot the uh, MBR. Yep, yep. And been having a little problem with that. I've been just kind of sitting down and relaxing and not, <laughs> not attacking it right now. <laughs> I think last time we even talked about putting in Windows, the Windows installation CD, and having it reinstall Windows over the existing Windows with the same version, but have not having it remove any partitions or anything, just having it reinstall right on top of it. Uh, some people call that a recovery installation uh, because it will reinstall Windows programs, but it won't change any of your configurations. Okay, so then once you get to the part where it says, uh, because it never comes up and it says repair, it just says, um, what is it? Uh, do you want to download now the operating system? And this is on the, the installation part. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And those those should yeah. install right from the original media. There shouldn't be any downloading. I mean, if you're installing, if you're using the, the Windows installation disk, um, the full, you know, four gig disk and plugging it in there and having it run through on the DVD-ROM, there shouldn't be much to install, although it does copy files to your hard drive. It doesn't have to download anything necessarily, although you do get the option to download fresh files. You certainly don't have to. Okay, but it gets, it doesn't take me, sometimes it doesn't take me to the option where I can just repair the files or put new files on. It wants me to reboot the oper operating system completely. Yeah, and the, the, the what I call recovery installation where you are installing isn't a repair of the operating system because if you've ever noticed for folks that have done these installations before with Windows, when you first start it up, 
It gives you options on whether you can install the operating system, but there's other options to repair that you hit R to repair the operating system. And I'm not talking about a repair. I'm talking about hitting enter to normally install the OS. And what it should do is find the folder that currently has the Windows operating system, and you can simply select it and have it continue with the installation. In fact, it might even tell you, hey, there's a Windows here. Is that OK? And like, yes, you need to fix yourself, and you can continue through. OK. OK. Yeah, I've been, like I said, I bought this disk and put the disk in, but the disk was doing something strange for a couple of days, and I came to find out that my DVD CDR ROM was not working oh, properly. You're so <laughs> it's, one, it's not one thing, it's another. Yeah, so, the, well, this computer's about 10 years old. Okay. So, so um, what I did was I just let it sit for a couple of days and said, I'm not going to take my head through all these changes. To get the information, uh, I'll just take it little by little because I don't want to blow up trying to get this stuff. And I think one of the things we even talked about before was taking the drive physically out and using an external USB-connected drive caddy to even just copy files over to a new operating system. This may be ultimately the best way to do it. And I think that's what I'm going to wind up doing. I do have a Docker. Yep. Okay, and a dual Docker. So I think that's the only thing I'm going to be able to do right now. I just have to... Uh, use a computer that I have enough uh, information or, or gigabytes on a hard drive to transfer over to that one. Right. That that I think, that in fact, if I'm ever having to, to do as much juggling as you're doing, I just give up, pull the drive out, stick it in, and copy what I need. I'll, I think it's probably the fastest the thing you could do at this point. And that's, yeah, exactly. Um, my other question was, do you um, know of any way of if you're using WordPress in a blog or in your uh, um, website, to be able to email um, your subscribers through the WordPress. Well, WordPress for those application. right. The word as as many people have uh, may be familiar. WordPress is probably the 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 largest and certainly most popular content management system. Whenever you hear somebody talking about a CMS, WordPress is probably there at the top. Um, it's one of these things that we created like Joomla, like WordPress, and indeed things even like the blogger system from Google. It's one where you simply put the content in and the whole creation of the web pages is done for you automatically behind the scenes. And it gives you the nice management front end to be able to do this. The, the Professor Messer website, for instance, is a WordPress website. I just simply okay. throw in my text for the pop quiz of the day or I throw in my text to say, here's the new video and the link to it. And WordPress takes care of everything else. There's nothing inside of WordPress that does an email, that will send out an email to everybody who is one of your WordPress users. Um, and, and so you have to use third-party systems to be able to make that happen. One system that was very, very common for a while was uh, FeedBurner, which was a product that was acquired by Google. And ultimately, I think Google decided not to support that any longer. And it was one that if you changed anything, it would recognize in your RSS feed that, oh, there's some new content, and it would email out, email out everybody that this was updated. In fact, I think I still get some, the people that are still have some of my old ones on my website. That's one way to do it. Um, there are another a, a number of other ones out there as well. I wish I could remember the ones offhand. The way I do it on my website is to simply ask you to join an email list. So my pop quiz of the day is one where I'm using a third party called Aweber, but there's plenty. There's MailChimp. There's there's a lot of different email providers. And so you yeah, subscribe I to have, a list and, and you do it that way. I have Aweber and I'm just finding out um, what I did was I put a um, an opt-in uh, form yep. Yep. On, on my site sure. so that my uh, subscribers can opt-in into my uh, email and newsletter. Sure. And I think that because I couldn't figure out how to download my email list from WordPress uh -huh. to uh, Aweber. This is it's sort of a, a sticky wicket. Uh, Very. It is because email and, and the, the sending of email is, I, I wouldn't say heavily regulated, but there are many rules that you must comply with to send mail to people. And even then, people don't like getting the mail that even them, they themselves signed up for. 
uh, this mailing list that I have. Uh, if you're on the live um, study group, I had you register. It's really registering you with AWeber because when you registered, you got an email back automatically from me that said, okay, you're in there and I'm going to send you an update just before we start. And then what I do is I just delete everything there every month and I start fresh. So I don't even keep your emails around. It's really more of a convenience that I have for you so that you'll receive a message when that comes up. And I save your questions too, so I can show you those questions afterwards and, and use that material as well. Um, and the A-plus study group I have is massive. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people that get my uh, email every day. So that's another one, but I can download those anytime I want into a comma separated value file. I can put it in Excel. In fact, that's what I do for my study group. I download everybody who's registered. I pull it up in Excel and I start sorting and coloring and changing and things and find out what people are interested in getting questions on that month. Okay, because what basically what you're using is an autoresponder to get your emails out to people. Exactly. So once you're in that list, I've already set up a scheduled email that says, okay, if you're in this email list for the registrations on Saturday at 1155, send out this reminder email. Okay. So what I need to do is just be patient and let people just start opting in. I think it's probably one of the best things you can do if you have a, if you have a website, getting an email list going sounds kind of archaic. Don't you mean a Twitter feed? Don't you mean putting an Instagram up? Well, you should do those as well. But email is still a remarkably viable way to communicate with the people that come to your website. And I send, I, I make people crazy in marketing because marketing people will tell you, oh, don't send more than one email in a week. And it needs to be on a Thursday at, at 9 a.m. for them. I send an email every day to over 10,000 people and it drives them yeah, crazy. I get every day. Right. Uh, if I don't send an email during the week, people complain to me that I didn't send them an email. It's it's completely opposite to what the industry is accustomed to. But I think that is the industry not understanding that perhaps they're not sending the most high-quality emails they should be. I send a question every day that I make up myself. I sit there, on, I write all of these questions out, I put them in there, and it's something you can use. And I think we should all be thinking that way if we're trying to build communities on our websites. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's what I've been... Um, sitting down and going through a Weber, I've been with them for a minute, but I just decided my um, website, uh, anzcomputerrepair.com, has has about three thousand some odd subscribers. That's great. Now, so that's fantastic. You know, trying to get out. Excuse me. That's fantastic, and you should absolutely keep them updated to things you are doing, and make sure that they here's a here's a discount, here's a here's a sale that you could do. Bring your machine in. Those are the types of things that email makes perfect sense for. Sounds good. Anthony, Thank thanks for so calling. Good right, to hear from right you. Way. Let us know how, how it goes. I've been using AWeber for a long time, and they've been great for me. Uh, I don't I don't have a, 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 a link that anybody can use to, to go back and, and see theirs, but I'll, I'll stick something in the, the notes so that people know where that is. It's AWeber.com. Okay. Thanks, Anthony. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. There's um, the mailing is... Uh, a remarkable business. Um, there have been times when the, the email hasn't gone out because of a technical problem. Very rare for that to happen. Uh, but, you know, something on the Internet, a denial of service or other piece, and uh, it's remarkable. Um, the, the emails I get saying, hey, where's my question today? I think we should all be striving to have emails that are that good. I think I'm going to go back to, I think this is 615. I may have been on this one before. Are you there, caller? That's the hissy one. Makes a hissing noise. All right, I'm going to put you on hold. We may not get a, a 615 today. We've got other callers here, though. Let me flip over first to the, the chat room. Sorry, chat room. I've got you over here and not seeing, making sure there's nothing too glaring going on I should know about. Uh, the next one up is the 559 area code. Are you there, caller? Hello. Hello. How are you, sir? What's your name? Oh. Hello, um, I'm Andrew. I called in last month. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, from, you called me Mr. Buddy Power last month because my microphone set up was appalling where I was temporary stationed. Um, it's it's a little a muffled bit. today, but we can make do. Oh, muffled. <laughs> um, right, well, as long as it's better than last month, anyway. Um, basically, I completed my CCNA A-plus oh. last week with... On my 801, I got a score of 
783. Congratulations. And I made the dog by five. Um, I was just wondering what would be my next possible step. So this is a, a pretty common question, too, is you've got through the A-plus piece. You've now got that certification there. What should we do next? Um, and, and I almost turn it around every time someone asks that question is, do you have an idea or are, or I think most people do have an idea at this point of the type of things with technology that interest you? For instance, does uh, working inside of the system and repairing interest you? Does setting up servers and server operating systems get you excited? Do you like to do networking or does networking appeal to you? Do you like the security side of it? Do databases make you interested? Um, I, that is the point where you can kind of start diversifying your certifications into those particular areas. Do you have a particular area that you found really interests you a lot at the moment? Um, well, I have been messing around with um, Cisco, uh, Cisco um, Windows Server 2008 R2. So I am um, a little um, domestic tone environment. Domestic, not um, sure. domain test environment. Sorry. Um, but that's just virtual machine stuff. The actual server is physical. It's running on a old backup PC of mine. Um, but that seems to interest me quite a lot about what I can do with group policy and and I can do it to using computers. That really interests me, does that? As someone who travels around and sees a lot of different networks and a lot of different companies, we need more people that know how to use group policy. <laughs> Because I work with some systems that are well done and they have put it together and made systems that are usable yet are properly controlled. I've been other places where it's wide open. I've been other places where a machine is so locked down, all you can do is really log in and click an icon and that's it. Um, and I work on the security side generally during the week. So I need to load services and do some other things at the desktop. And I have to get five people in the room who can give me accounts and change the security policies and do the other pieces. I think the Microsoft side is a great place to go. So there's there's kind of two places you could go with this. I think everybody should have a networking background of some kind, at least a little bit. And I will often say if you've already got the A plus and you're trying to move towards something else, a networking piece of some kind it doesn't have to be network plus. Microsoft has their own networking courses. Cisco has their own networking courses. Get some networking because you can use networking anywhere in IT. You can use it in data centers, in databases. You can use it for programming. You can use networking everywhere. And it's a nice foundation to have. I'm not talking about configuring switches and routers. I'm talking about just understanding networks and how they operate. Something like the Network Plus uh, exam uh, or objectives would be a good place to go for this. Another uh, thing to consider that Microsoft side extremely powerful, extremely useful, because so many people are using Windows. If you know the server operating systems in Microsoft, you can apply all of that knowledge back to the desktop. Because if you're in a desktop, you're looking at file manager, and you're looking to, uh, to set up a connection to a share and pull those files down, and something isn't working properly, if you knew the operating system side for 2008 R2 or 2012, you'd be able to apply that back to the desktop and how it works. And knowing how to use group policy, knowing how to implement a Windows domain, understanding the trusts, especially understanding the trust when it gets very complex for us and you have multiple domains, you have to create trust between them. This can be very complex, but if you understand the foundation and you can build on that, uh, you can have a very nice career on the Microsoft side as well. Because I'm currently doing a six week worth of work experience at a local council where I live. Great. And they've got a very extensive Active Directory service. Um, and I've been just, well, I've been looking through that myself to see how it all works. And it, it's really interesting how they map the drives via group policy and how they allow access to certain software via group policy, how they allow remote desktop by group policy and stuff like that. It's just, it really interests me, that's all. You, you are in, uh, it's one of those things when you're in an, an internship or you've got a short-term job or you're just getting into a new position, you often don't realize how useful the information is that you happen to be immersed into. And it sounds like the particular role you're in right now can give you a lot of practical knowledge to use anywhere you want to go. So you're in a perfect place. You're learning the right things. 
uh, you're getting some whoever is is already working there has been doing uh, a fantastic job at putting together the group policies and being able to implement them properly and use them properly in a Windows domain. You should absolutely ask as many questions as you can. Have them explain to you how they initially set it up, how the Active Directory is set up, and how what they would like to change with Active Directory if they had the option. Uh, why they use group policy. How do they handle machines that are not part of the domain? Um, how do you handle Mac OS 10 devices or Linux that you might have in the environment? Ask as many questions as possible. That's really going to help you going forward. Okay, I'll do that. Thanks for calling in, and good luck. Let us know how it goes, Andrew. Okay, I will do it. And thank you very much for helping me get through my A+. Your videos have been incredibly helpful to me. Your A+, study guide was absolutely essential to me passing the exam. That's so, great to hear. I, and I, I really do appreciate that. I often say that, that you guys really do all the hard work. I just make the videos. And it's kind of nice to get that uh, that feedback the other direction as well. Best of luck to you. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. There's um, more people on the phone. We need to get through these. I'm going to shotgun some folks through. Um, uh, about Andrew's call very quickly. Um, uh, I, I Whenever you get into those environments, you're – maybe just, I say just on a help desk, that's where I started in IT at the corporate level, get on that help desk and start asking questions. Uh, go to the user's desks, understand what they're doing and how it works. Uh, get packet captures, talk to the networking people. Um, figure out what you want to do and go help those people do those things. That's how you move up in IT. You learn more and ultimately that helps you everywhere you go with everything that you're doing. Okay. Um, so some of you are sending me um, direct messages on on the chat. I'm sorry I can't address them at this very moment, but uh, I'll get to them after we are done. Let's go to the 617 area code. Are you there, caller? I sort of hear someone back there who probably is, is listening to the feed and not listening to the phone because we are about 15 to 40, 15, 30, 45 seconds slower then that piece is. I'm going to put you back on hold. We'll come back to you because I can go now to the 559 area code. Are you there, caller? Yes. Yes, you yeah. are. Are you there, caller 559? What's your name? Norris. Is it Norris? Norris. L-U-I-S. Oh, how are you, Lewis? What can we do for you today? Uh, it's a great show. I just want to say that uh, you have a great show on, on, on radio. Uh, and to get my uh, and I started, but I put it on hold for uh, uh, for a few days because I got to look for employment. So what are the key points that I, I have to take into consideration when taking the a plus exam? Okay. The is it? Are you looking at more general things before talk, walking in and taking the A plus exam? Like you, you're ready, like uh, right now to take the exam. What should you be considering? No, no, I haven't taken the exam yet. I am going to take the exam, but I'm starting. You know, I'm starting for it, and I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to take it in the next two or three weeks. Perfect. This, I, I'm so glad you're asking this question now. Uh, because I, I get a lot of people that come to my website and they ask um, on the website, hey, I'm going to take this exam in an hour. What should I do? <laughs> like, well, there's, there's not much you could do in an hour uh, to be able to do this. You really should come in about a week or two before and ask me this question. So this really does give me an opportunity to answer this question. And if I had one thing, one one primary thing to tell people when they're ready to now now go in and take the exam, they should download the exam objectives from the CompTIA website. These exam objectives are detailed. They tell you everything that you need to know to, to pass the exam. Every single bit of content associated with the A-plus exam is in there. I'm going to show you a picture of one here. But I use it uh, before I go into a test as a, as a final checklist. And this final checklist gives me an opportunity to give to, to really give me the feedback on, do I really know everything I should know? Because it will tell you straight up. Here is the here's the certification exam objectives for the 22801. I know you can't see this on, on your side, but you can watch the replay later. And it tells you not just what you should study for from a domain perspective, but it tells you 
exactly the questions that will be asked of you. So section 1.1 is going to be configure and apply BIOS settings. You have to install firmware upgrades, the BIOS component information, configurations, diagnostics, monitoring. I'm going to skip down. We talked about micro ATX and ITX earlier. You know, Here's the things you have to know. I'm going to scroll down even further. Look at all this detail. You have to know optical drive, CD-ROM, DVD-ROM, and Blu-ray. And you have to understand how to install and configure those and use appropriate media. We had one of those questions there. So if I had to give you a, a master, uh, uh, my best possible tip before you go into the exam, Lewis, is that one, is download those exam objectives. You might even want to print them off. My, uh, my PDF reader allows me to take pieces of this and highlight it. So I can go through and even click a button and click and effectively check off things that I want. But you might want to even print it out and use a pen and check off the things you know really well. And if you run into some topics that you feel you aren't strong with, that is the cue for you to go back and watch a video, read a book, or get more familiar with that particular topic. Yeah, I have the uh, I have the material, the A plus material. Uh, my other question would be where would I be able to see the this this the this show where I am speaking to you so I can see the uh, uh, um, so I can see uh, show me so you can show me the you know. Yeah, once we're off the phone, if you go to the Professor Messer website, uh, right after we're done, uh, actually even right now, you could restart this and watch it at professormesser.com slash live, L-I-V-E. And you can see this immediately go through and replay the entire study group from the very beginning. Uh, I will also have edited versions that are available a few days later that I make available on my website, but it's exactly the same content. So that would be a good place to go to, to view that. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I've been watching the show today the whole day, you know, because I am even subscribed to your sessions for the A-plus certification group. Great. And I've been watching the show, so I'm going to go ahead and, you know, keep on looking at to see if I see the, the, what I'm talking about. Thank, thank you. you very much for your help, and have a good one. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, for those of you that also want to be able to download those objectives, you can go to professormesser.com slash objectives, and that will take you to the exam objectives as well. So that's another place you can go to have a look at those. Um, we're streaming right along, so to speak, of those things. Let me hop over to the, the chat room. I've got a lot of the screens all that I have here. I'm not always in the chat room and looking at the pieces here. So I'm trying to, to have you pop up and and go over there once in a while and a while and see uh see what folks are saying in those pieces. So let's go back to the calls. Uh let's go to the 718 area code. Are you there, caller? Hello. Hello, what's your name? Hi, how are you? I'm Amir. Hello, Amir. What can we do for you today? Uh so I've uh I've had my laptop and uh my bias. I've put a password on it. So basically what happened is I went into my laptop in the mud board and I've pulled out the CMOS battery, but it doesn't seem to reset the password. Didn't do that, Why did that? it? Yes. Um, the, the manufacturers of laptops have little power sources in a lot more than one place and in some cases are storing the password in uh, memory that is non-volatile, in many, many cases flash memory, which doesn't require a power source. So you could even remove, you can remove the batteries, you move the internal batteries, you remove power from the laptop, and it's still going to have a password. There's, there's no power source you can remove to actually remove the configuration of the laptop. Now, one of the things... Okay, cause, go ahead. Okay, yeah, because uh, there was like one motherboard I've encountered where uh, there was like a jumper. Yep. You just move the jumper and it resets right. it, but this one here, it's, I don't know... <laughs> That, and that's usually what it involves. It usually involves something extra. It may be uh, executing a certain program from startup. You have to have this on a DVD-ROM or a bootable USB so that you can start this up. It may be shorting out a couple of pins with a jumper. It may be um, another configuration setting on the inside of the laptop. Laptops especially are, are very proprietary. And the manufacturers want it to be this way. It should not be easy to to remove a security password from a mobile device. 
Um, and that's in, in the Professor Messer chat rooms. People will come in often and say, how do I remove a password from this laptop? Um, and, and first, it, it's difficult when you're in a chat room to know where this laptop came from because I don't want to be giving the bad guys the information they need to get by security of a device that's not really theirs. So what I generally okay. tell people, and probably it's the best idea anyway, is contact the manufacturer of that laptop because they can do security checks to make sure that you legitimately have that product because you don't want somebody else taking your laptop and removing the password. Um, and then that's they can true. tell you the, the proper configuration settings to be able to do this. Sometimes the laptop manufacturer doesn't want you doing it and they require you to take it to a certified laptop manufacturer hard for that particular piece of hardware to get it repaired that's when unfortunately you kind of have to do a lot of more google searching uh, and hunting through forums to perhaps find the information you need but i haven't seen an instance yet where i couldn't have found that on the internet somewhere there are a lot of independent um independent uh, repair shops that do these kinds of things and they share that information on the internet as well but ultimately the manufacturer is the best place to start okay thank you so much good luck amir let us know how it goes all right have a good one take Bye. care that is that's always a challenge and i i apologize for those in the chat room sometimes they'll come into the chat room in the middle of the week and say how do i remove this and i say i i'm not going to talk to you about that you need to go to the manufacturer uh they will be able to take care of that and that's why i do it because i I don't know where this laptop came from, and I want the legitimate owner to be the one who's working with the manufacturer. Let's go to the 617 area code. Are you there, caller? I think this was the one that was listening in earlier. I hear somebody back there. Are you there, caller? 617 area code? Like he's right there. You can almost hear him, can't you? I'm going to put you back on hold. We'll go to 615. Are you there, 615? This was the hissy one from earlier. For those of you calling in, you're probably calling in. Um, I've got that guest call in line that you can certainly use at 347-989-8745. Uh, another one that you can use to call in um, is over Skype. And if you're calling in over Skype, a nice tip is to call the nice Skype lady um, that will do a Skype test call for you. You've seen the Skype test call in your list. It's, a, it's an automatic one that's in your list of callers. Call that, and you can talk to the Skype test lady, and she tells, she replies back to you with what you said. She records and sends it back to you. So you can tell if your microphone's working okay and if everything else is working okay. Let's try the uh, 617 area code. Are you there, caller? I think we tried that 617 before. Then we're hopping over to 773. Are you there, 773? Hello, Professor. Hello. Who is I? Who am I talking to? Joe, sir. Hello, Joe. Joe. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. What can I we do for you? I your, uh, enjoy your show very much. Thank I you. I really appreciate all the, all the hard work you do to provide such a useful and very, very important information. It's, it's a lot of fun, but don't tell anybody that. They'll think it's really, really hard and arduous. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You, uh, you, you, you'll be very successful, I'm sure, because you work so hard. <laughs> so far, so good. What can we do for you, Joe? Yes. Uh, in one of your previous shows, you said there was a software that will test the compatibility of any component that you want to install on your computer. I wrote it somewhere. I can't find it. Can you, do, you know, do you remember that? I suspect I was talking about the process of installing a new operating system, a Windows operating system, and there is a compatibility program. I'm going to find out the compatibility piece on the Windows Compatibility Center that will tell you if you're plugging in something in Windows, will this thing work properly? Um, Microsoft does this because obviously, unlike Apple's hardware, which is all locked down, if you were buying a Mac, a Mac's only going to have certain kinds of, 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 of uh, video adapters. It's going to have certain kinds of USB chipsets inside of it. It's going to have certain kinds of processors and it's not going to have any other kind. So it's very easy for Apple to ensure that their operating system is going to work properly because it's the, their own hardware. Uh, but Windows can run on anything. It can run on any machine out there. And there are 
hundreds of different kinds of video cards and hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but tens of different kinds of USB chipsets, maybe hundreds at this point. The challenge, of course, is, is that Microsoft has to have drivers available that will work with all of those things. So if you just Google Microsoft Windows Compatibility Center, you will get a page that says a search button on it says, see what works. And you can not only type in a particular product name and it will tell you if that version of that product is compatible and which Windows it's compatible with, you can even do a scan to scan your computer, and it will check to see if what's on your computer will work with other operating systems. So if you're planning an upgrade and going from Windows 7 to Windows 8.1, it will tell you if your hardware, if your printer, and if your applications will work properly when you go to that new OS. Uh, uh, I understand, sir. What about if you want to install a, an external preferred component to your system, whether it's motherboard, and you want to see if that component is really compatible. Same thing. The hardware? Yep. The same, same, thing. Oh. same page. In fact, right on the front page, it even says popular products on Windows 8.1. And one that it uses, here's an example, the Cisco USB Ethernet adapter, which is a, a USB device. You plug into a USB port, and it gives you an Ethernet connection out on the other side. That's a good example of how you can take any product. Uh, they've got uh, a tune-up utilities program. There's Autodesk, which is an application. There's a VPN client, which is an application. There are smartphones listed on here, so you can tell if your smartphone is going to be compatible with your operating system. So they've got a gamut of different um, operating system, uh, hardware, applications, and other devices, and it will just tell you the compatibility across all those. Yes, very good. Thank you very much for the answer. That was great. I quite, appreciate that. Quite welcome, Joe. Thanks for calling. Yeah, that uh, compatibility. You Have a great day. You too. Really comes in handy. I, I've used this because uh, I've just bought a new USB um, uh, drive chassis that I use to plug into my uh, storage area network or my network address storage that I have. Um, and the network attached storage I have is... It's, this is one that lays down. Usually usually you see those where you stick the hard drive in, it sticks up. Well, this one sits flat. And I, I went out here and made sure that my operating system would be compatible before purchasing that because I didn't want to be in a position where I wouldn't be able to use that once I got it. Or I yeah, have to go through returns and do those other things. Nobody wants to do that either. Well, I've got a few calls here. I'm trying to remember which ones I've gone to and which ones I haven't. I think 661, Eric Coder, are you there, caller? Mmm, pita bread. That sounds great. Are you there, caller? Hello? 661. Hey, are you there? What's your name? Excellent. My name is David. Hello, Let me David. Ask you something. I heard that the A plus certification exam is going to be changed, removing any information about Windows XP and upgraded to Windows 8.1. What can you tell me about that? Sounds like a great idea. They probably should do that. But CompTIA at this point has not announced any changes to the A plus certification exam. They are, of course, certainly ultimately going to be changing it and updating it eventually. Uh, but who knows when that's going to be because they've not announced anything. It's also questionable on whether they would remove Windows XP at this point. Um, Windows XP still run on millions of computers. People are still going to need to know how to in how to perhaps not install it, but certainly manage the troubleshooting of it. They might pull off the installation piece of it, but it's still going to be an important operating system, at least for the short term going forward. Uh, I will tell you what happened last time, because here's what happened. You know, Windows 8.1 really become has become very popular lately. When the latest version of the CompTIA exam, the 801 and 802 were released, Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Windows 7 are part of that exam. But since that was released, which is over a year ago now, Windows 8's really gotten a lot of people that are running it. So it would make perfect sense for CompTIA to add Windows 8 into the exam objectives. This have almost exactly same thing happened when the 700 series exam came out. When the 700 series exam came out, it was Windows XP and Windows Vista. But Windows 7 wasn't on it. And what what they did at CompTIA is overnight, they simply updated the exam objectives and added Windows 7 to the list. And they didn't change the numbers. They didn't tell anybody. They just said, okay. The, in fact, they didn't even make an announcement. They just put a new version of the exam objectives on their website 
and Windows 7 was now suddenly part of the exam. It was still the 22701 and 22702, but it was now had new objectives associated with it. There's no reason they couldn't do the same thing with the 801 and 802. They might tomorrow put a new exam objective on there, and those exam objectives have Windows 8.1 included with the exam objectives. I don't know if they'll do that or not. I don't know if they'll change the numbers. I, I don't know if they'll even update it all at all or if they'll just simply wait until the next major release, which might be the 900 series exams. Uh, but I would, before I took my exam, highly recommend that people download the objectives and see what's on there. At this point, it's pure speculation. I think we all would would hope that they would have Windows 8. We're seeing it more and more in the enterprise. They probably might. They might include XP. They might get rid of XP. Um, I think they would probably keep it at this point, but we're just all guessing. There's no real way to know at this point. So I wish I had a, a more conclusive or solid answer I rely on most people to tell me. So if, if you download the exam objectives one day, David, and it has Windows 8, please tell me because I might not have seen it yet. Awesome, awesome. And I have, I have one last, sure. uh, last sort of question. I'm a little confused about in the, about the Windows firewall, what the difference between inbound and outbound is. Like Let's say if I have a, a program in my computer and I want to block it from accessing the Internet, sure. do, I, do I put a rule in the, as an inbound or an outbound rule? This, this gets even more complicated if you're on a network-based firewall. You'll sometimes see the terms egress and ingress, like we aren't making this harder for ourselves to keep up with all of these names. Right. The perspective of Windows Firewall is always from the perspective of the inside of your computer. So whenever it says to block outbound traffic, it's referring to you where you're sitting in your chair sending traffic out to the internet. When it's referring to inbound traffic, it's always talking about somebody on the internet trying to send information inbound into your computer. So it's always from the perspective of where you happen to be sitting behind that keyboard. Gotcha. If you're oh, looking to prevent an application from talking to the internet, then you need to create an outbound rule for that. Awesome. Thank you, and I love your show. Thanks, David. And Appreciate your calling. Inside. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're going to go back to those. Uh, we've got those last two calls on the line. We're up to, uh, for those of you that haven't really followed the this up to this uh, my, my after shows, we get about a two-hour block where I'm able to keep the phone lines up. And then after the two hours, nobody can call in. I can take the calls that are there. So we've got these two calls here. Uh, the 617 area code, are you there? I can hear you back there, 617. Are you there? Say something. Say your name. I hear you. You're, I hear the microphone or something bumbling around there. Oh, I just hate it. Difficult to hear anything going through there. That might be a worthwhile, let's try the Skype person and try the Skype update. Let's go back to 615. Are you there, 615? Maybe, maybe not. Well, we gave it we gave it a shot with those. I think uh, the six one five and the six one seven area codes. You might do well to check your microphones, or you have to listen in on this on the phone call. Unfortunately, there's too big of a delay uh, if you're listening in. It could be as long as thirty seconds or a little bit more on the delay for doing those things. Um, boy, there's a lot of virtualization talk in the chat room right here, um, and working with that, I was talking about you know recovery of operating systems and doing those things, and it it. Uh, it hiked up there. There were a number of questions I got. Go back to another one since we're talking about questions dealing with the exam. And this is one that I that came in this week, which was, what's the best way to receive CE points to keep my A-plus certification current? And Edward called in and asked about this one. If you're worried about continuing education, um, go out to the CompTIA website, and there is a CompTIA page that talks all about continuing education um, from CompTIA. And they have a big list of all of the things that you need to know about for continuing education. Um, and you can do a lot of different things. Most people will take a CompTIA exam that's a higher level and it renews all of your lower level exams. And there's a list of what those levels are. I just, I'm trying to go at the CompTIA website right now. It's not even responding. Let's see CompTIA.org. Let's try anything. I'm Well, I'm on the net, but uh, the poor CompTIA website not doing so well. Maybe others are able to get there. Maybe they have uh, 
some load balancing that other people can get there. But go to the CompTIA website. If you renew your certification by taking a higher level CompTIA certification, you don't have to pay any money. So it's a very attractive way to keep your certification current by just taking the next level exam. So you got three years to take the next highest level exam. Uh, you can collect continuing education units, CEUs, by doing other things, writing blog entries, attending an industry event, going to local uh, user groups, attending a live event like this, and you can get certain pieces there to be able, certain uh, units that you can apply back to doing that. If you do it that way, you have, to, you have to pay an annual maintenance fee to CompTIA to be able to maintain and manage the process of you collecting those points. If you take a higher level certification exam from another manufacturer, you go to Microsoft and take one of their certifications, you go to Cisco and take one of their certifications, those will also accumulate CEUs, and in many cases, simply renew your CompTIA certifications, but you again have to pay those annual maintenance fees to be able to do that. If you wanna do it for free, which isn't really free, you have to pay to take the next highest level CompTIA exam. You don't have to pay anything extra if you take CompTIA, CompTIA's exam. So that's another way to do that piece with it. So that's a, that's one of those things. Okay, other people not able to get to CompTIA's website too. We've, we've overwhelmed it with our questions of continuing education. We were not able to, to keep it up and running with those pieces. That's, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But when, when the site comes back up, you're probably watching the replay. That's a good way to do it as well. I think that's, that's a great piece to go through. Let's see. We've got, I think we've been able to get through all of the calls. I'm sorry for the folks that called in. We just weren't able to connect up with you. We can certainly try it next time. You can always send me a message directly as well to the Professor Messer website. There's a contact us link at the very top. I try to reply to everybody that's humanly possible. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. So we'll we'll try to uh, try to get back with you though. If you have questions, at least I can send a one liner or some links back to you to get you back to some of those other sites as well. Um, throughout the month, we do one of these every month. So in July, we'll do another one. And if you want to know when we're doing it, go to the Professor Messer website slash calendar and you can learn all about that piece as well. If there's other things that you would like to see or you would simply like to send me some feedback on how um, how is the uh, how is this format? Did we like doing all questions in the first hour? Should we do half questions and should we do half calls? I, I love to hear from you. We want to make this your your uh, your study group. Um, and this is a great way to do it, I think, to get your feedback and do that piece. Thanks for joining us today. We've got uh, a lot more we're going to do next month, and we look forward to seeing you there on the Professor Messer A-plus study group. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.